We come now to our scripture reading this morning. It's found in John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Please turn to your Bible to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and se- to 17. Please stand and follow along as I read this short passage. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Verse 17. And the world is passing away with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. May God bless his own words. Please be seated. Let's open our hearts and our ears now to this morning's preaching, Know Your Enemy, the World. Good afternoon, church. It's good to see everyone. Let's, uh, let's come before the Lord and ask for his, his favor at this time. God, we thank you, we thank you, Lord, that you um, speak to us, Lord, that you have given a clear testimony of yourself and of the way of salvation. Lord, as we, as we study your word, uh, Lord, we know that we are weak, that we're um, distracted, and that we can easily misunderstand, so we ask for your spirit to enlighten the eyes of our hearts, open our minds, and that we would have compliant and humble spirits to receive uh, your words to us. Pray that you would use me uh, to be a vessel to, uh, to speak your word. Would you bless us at this time? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you can see, um, we are doing something different today. Uh, we've been going through Luke, and so uh, the, the session, uh, it's been our plan to break Luke up into three chunks because it's such a, it's a very long book, and we've been kind of going sort of slow, slowly through Luke. And so... Uh, We are going to pause in that series. Well, we're actually going to visit it again in three weeks with uh, the Palm Sunday. Uh, It just happens to be that the next passage is Palm Sunday. We're going to do a little alignment there. But other than that one revisit, we'll be taking a break from Luke. For now, we have a a little mini-series. The EM will be going through a little mini-series, as you can see in your bulletins called know your enemy and today's is part one there's three parts so we're gonna we're gonna go through know your enemy parts one two and three and then after easter we will begin a new uh series t not tbd uh it'll be in nehemiah we will continue where we left off in ezra if you recall some while ago uh ezra and nehemiah go together And so we will continue with that narrative in the Old Testament. So why a series on on the enemies, on your enemy? What what does that mean? Well, it is reality of the Christian life that we face opposition. If any of you are familiar with the book by Paul Bunyan, Paul Bunyan? John Bunyan? Paul Bunyan. 
John Bunyan, excuse me, thank you, thank you, son. Um, Pilgrim's Progress, the, it's an allegory where Christian, he's the main character, his name is Christian, but it he's a Christian. He is on his way from the city of destruction to the celestial city. It's, a, it's, a, it's an allegory, it's, it, it's talking about the Christian life. And he's on his way to heaven. But on his way, we find that he is under frequent attack. He runs into all sorts of enemies. They're not all doing the same exact things. They're doing various things. And these enemies, what do they do? They try to impede him, impede his progress. They, if some of them are, they're not successful in his case, but with others, they stop them in their tracks and basically prevent them from getting to that celestial city, to heaven. And that's the reality of the Christian life, that we have enemies. We have those who are hindering us in our Christian walks, and some who try to prevent us altogether from getting to our destination. And if we are going to stand firm against attack, then it stands to reason that we must, that you must know your enemy. Um, to, to take the words of Sun Tzu, uh, I don't need to get into that, but you know, the art of war says that you must know your enemy. All right? We must know, if we're going to have, if we're under attack, it helps to know where are these attacks coming from. Uh, it helps to know in what way are we being opposed in, as, we, as we try to live the Christian life? Of course, on the one hand, we can just simply boil it all down to sin. We can just call everything against us sin. Yes, sin is the enemy of the Christian. But on the, on the other hand, the Bible gives us a more detailed account of our enemy, our enemies. And that detailed account helps us to be able to stand firm, to be able to identify where the attack is coming from and uh, allow us to stand firm. Today's guiding passage, not today, the, the guiding passage for the series uh, is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. This is, in this passage, and there are other passages in the scriptures, but I'm going to focus on Ephesians chapter 2. In this passage, Paul identifies three enemies of the Christian. And today, obviously, part one, we're going to talk about the world. So let me go ahead and read Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says to the believers in, in Ephesus, And you were dead in your trespasses. You used to be dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world. You used to follow the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. You used to follow the prince of the power of the air. Otherwise known as the devil. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among whom we all once lived. In the passions of our flesh. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, this passage here doesn't uh, neatly tell us these are the three enemies of the Christian, but we can see that in our former lives, that is, in the former life of the Christian, you are dead in your sins and trespasses, and that can be described in three different ways. You used to, follow the course of this world. In, the, in other words, the world is going in one direction and you are sw swimming right along. You used to follow the prince of the power of the air. You used to follow Satan. Not, not in that you worshipped him, but he's going in this direction. You, you, you were under his influence. And thirdly, you once lived in the passions of your flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. The sinful nature that's within you, 
That's, sim that's simply how you lived. So these are the three enemies described by Paul here. We got the world, we have Satan, and we have our own flesh. But the way this passage describes our enemies, it sounds like, oh, these used to be our enemies. Is that, is that the case? Are they no longer a problem for us? No, they continue to be a problem for us. They continue to attack us and, and try to hinder us. That's, that's why in the book Pilgrim's Progress, Christian is hindered. He's attacked. And what's at risk here? What's at risk? Well, let me read from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Paul is writing to um, his protege, Timothy, and he's, and he's at the end of his letter, and he writes about someone they know, someone who used to be a coworker. Verse 10, 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul says, For Demas, his name is Demas, in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas used to be a uh, fellow missionary with Paul, but he's deserted Paul in his, in his missionary journeys. Why? Because he was in love with this present world. You can, the enemies of the Christian can... The danger here is that they can... Hinder, your, hinder you, stop you in your tracks altogether that you will not end up, end up at your destination. The enemies of the Christian are serious. They can, these, they are doing, fighting us for our souls. They can, they are fighting us so that perhaps we would be re-enslaved re-enslaved by the world and by Satan and by our own flesh. And so these are battles, these are enemies we fight for our own souls. These three enemies, by the way, the world, the devil, and the flesh, they work together. They work in cahoots with each other, but they're also distinguishable from each other. So for our purposes, we're going to take each one, each one separately um, today, we're going to talk about the world. Now, our passage today, again, is from 1 John chapter 2, verses, 1 to th verses uh, 15 to 17. The primary command that we hear from the Bible with respect to the world is simply this. Do not love the world. Do not love the world. But that raises the question, what is the world? What does the Apostle John mean by the world? What does it mean when Paul says that we used to follow the course of this world? Now, that word can be used in many different ways. For example, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. God so loved the world? And then 1 John 2.15, he says, Do not love the world? That might be a little confusing. Well, it's because that word can, be, can have different shades of meaning. And so this is what it doesn't mean when, when John is writing here, do not love the world. It doesn't mean God's creation, God's good gifts to, to his creation. God's good gifts are good, and they are meant to be enjoyed in their proper place and to the right proportion, right? There are many things that God has created. Uh, food is meant to be enjoyed in their proper place and to the right proportion. Of course, you know that even with food, you can go off the trails, off the tracks there. Marriage, God created to be enjoyed in their proper place and to the right proportion, and so on. What else does world not mean? It does not mean unbelievers. None, 
none of the enemies of the Christian are human beings, right? In none of these world, Satan, and the flesh does not refer to any people. They're, the enemies of the Christian are not people that we can hate. And so, again, John is not saying, do not love unbelievers. Our unbelieving friends, neighbors, and relatives, are, they're not the enemy. They're, in fact, the ones that we are called to love. And thirdly, what does world not mean? It, is, it does not mean just anything that's not directly related to Christianity or the church, right? So, for example, there's Christian music. You guys know the whole Christian music industry. And then there's non-Christian music, also called secular music. So, it, this, this is not as simple as saying, oh, do not love the world. You can love the Christian music, but not the secular music. That's not quite what, it's not that clear cut, okay? That's not what this means. It doesn't just mean anything that's not directly related to, uh, related to Christian, that doesn't have that Jesus uh, fish stamped on it, means that you must not love it. That's not what this means. Rather, the world means the system of human existence that is hostile to God. Uh, to give a parallel, perhaps you'd, you've heard of the phrase systemic racism. And that phrase, what it means is, is the racism that's baked into systems. That's not necessarily uh, intentional, intentionally uh, done, right? Now, I'm not speaking about that, it said, that itself, but to borrow a concept from systemic racism... The world is systemic anti-Godism, if I could put it that way. The, the, the things in the world systems that are against God. For example, the Tower of Babel. The Tower, Tower of Babel is a perfect example. Here are people who want to build a city and a tower. Now, what's so bad about that? The sin, in the case of the... And, I'm talking about Genesis chapter 11, is not that they wanted to build a tower or build a city. It's that they wanted to make a name for themselves apart from, in opposition to, God. They didn't want, they wanted to be independent. They wanted to make a name for themselves independent from God. And so we all need discernment in order to know worldliness when we see it. We need discernment in order to know this is worldliness that's tempting me because it's not so obvious. It's not so obvious. Again, it's not a matter of saying, does it have the Jesus sticker on it? That, that's not uh, how you can tell whether or not something is, something falls under the heading of the world. The world doesn't explicitly advertise itself as anti-God, right? There is no neon sign with flashing lights that says, this is worldliness, beware of worldliness. No, we need wisdom. Because after all, the world is all around us. That, world, that word, by the way, uh, from the Greek for cosmos, uh, that's, and that's a word that we also know in English. But you think about the cosmos, it's everything. It's all around us. And that's why the biblical uh, authors use that word. And the influence of the world is atmospheric. What's atmospheric? It's the atmosphere. Do you guys consciously think about the atmosphere? the air you, you're breathing right now? You don't, right? It's, it's there. Without the atmosphere, you'd be dead, right? But it's there. The influence of the wor world is atmospheric. 
Related to that, it's invisible. You don't see it, but it's all around us. And finally, it's unconscious. Again, we don't think about it. Right? We don't think about the air, but it is indeed there. As Kevin DeYoung put, put it in a recent tweet, he's a, a pastor that I follow on Twitter, the world is catechizing us. Catechize means teaching, giving, giving, um, giving structured uh, teaching on, on biblical concepts. The world is catechizing us whether we realize it or not. The world is teaching us whether we realize it or not. And so we cannot use this excuse of, oh, it's all around us. And so, and so uh, you know, I can't help but following the world. The scriptures command us, John commands us to resist it, that we must do battle against it that we must reject the influence of the world upon us. And in, or, in order to do that, we must first, step one, know your enemy. Know your enemy. So what is the world? The first thing to know about the world, which we, we've already identified, is that it stands in opposition against God. This is the second half of verse five. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In him. The world and God stand in mutual opposition against each other. They stand in opposition against each other. So that if you love the world, you cannot love God. If you love God, you cannot love the world. It's one or the other. It seems so stark, right? It's so binary, black and white. Exactly. It's... The Bible presents it's faith or idolatry, right? You cannot have faith and idolatry. That, when you look at the, the Old Testament, you'll know faith and idolatry is what? Idolatry. Jesus himself taught this uh, not too long ago in Luke 16. Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't be friends with both masters. You cannot serve God and money. It's one or the other. James, the brother of Jesus, says something similar. Uh, by the way, uh, in our confession of sin, it began, you hypocrites. Well, James says, you adulterous people just to, not just to get your attention, but that is what we are, right? You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? If you are going to be friends with the world, and that is hatred of God. That is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be friend of the, a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Again, it's one or the other. There cannot be a friendly coexistence between God and the world, between faith and idolatry. To put it in Old Testament terms, you cannot worship God while you worship Baal on the side. On the Sabbath, you go and sacrifice to God in the temple, to Yahweh in the temple, and on, uh, on, the, on the next day, you go worship at Baal. That's when they worship. No, you can't do that. To put it in New Testament terms, you cannot obey the desires of the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit, He has given you holy, holy desires to please Him, to please the Father. You cannot, you cannot obey those desires while you also indulge in, in your sinful passions. These are mutually exclusive. Love and devotion to the one pushes out love and devotion to the other. And so here is one way that you can identify if something in your life fa falls under the category of the world. Does your pursuit of it, whatever it is, cause you to love the Father more? Does it cause you to love the Father more? Does it cause you to offer up 
sincere thanksgiving to the giver of all good gifts? Does, it, does partaking in this thing strengthen your worship of the Father? Or, or is it that, is it a competing love? A competing love that pulls you away from God. So that was the first thing to know about the world. The second thing to know about the world, which is related to the first point, John elaborates further in verse 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So here, John identifies for us three categories that help us to understand what he, what he means by the world. He calls it he calls the first category the desires of the flesh. Now, if you're familiar with uh, the New Testament at all, the flesh, that term, uh, carries various shades of meaning. Here, it simply refers to our physical bodies. Now, John is not saying that our bodies are evil in and of themselves, right? Uh, he's not saying the fact that you have hunger, that you thirst, and that you have various other bodily cravings, that's not evil in and of themselves. God, God created your body. Yes, we have God-given physical desires for food, for sleep, for sex. But what does the world say about those desires? The world says, ah, you have those desires? That is what life is all about, fulfilling those desires. Life is about satisfying your bodily appetites. See, the world forgets, or the world casts aside the fact that we are created in the image of God. What does that mean? To be created in the image of God means that we were created in righteousness, in knowledge, and in holiness. And so to be, to be a human is to lean into the fact that we are created in God's image, in righteousness, knowledge, and holiness. The world says, oh, and, and so in view of that, that should control the fact that we were created in, in no, righteousness, knowledge, and holiness should control how we go about fulfilling our physical desires. That, should, that, that is the controlling thing. It's not the physical desires are primary, it's that these things that we were creating God's image is primary about us. But the world says, no, 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 that's, that's nonsense. The world says to us, no, you, you are an animal. You're a product of evolution after all. You are an animal, and what do animals do? They give in to their animal instincts. Life is about fulfilling your animal instincts. Secondly, the, the desires of the eyes. Your eyes have desires, did you know that? This is referring to those things that your eyes want to see. We all know that visual spectacle can put a spell on us. Right? There are things, especially in our technological age, on screens, that put a spell on us. Not to unnecessarily call out some little people I know, but as soon as I turn on the TV, right, it's, it's like, it's a, it's a magical spell. And all these little eyes are, oh, whatever they were doing, they, were, they could be reading the most interesting book. Oh, it's like, and, and, and their, their eyes are glued. They can't move. And then, and then if the TV were shut off, it's like, what happened, right? This doesn't affect only children, though. This affects all of us. What captures your eyes? For example, what, when it crosses your field of vision, causes you to turn your head and take a closer look and take a second and third look? What allures you with its appearance, with its seeming beauty? When you scroll through the internet, through social media, 
What is it that your eyes itch to see? It used to be that when that you used you had to go out and look for these things. But of course, that's not the case anymore in the modern age that we live in. Advertisers are after your eyes. They want to capture your eyes, and it's so easy to do. They just put up alluring images. But it's even more de devious now, because now, as I'm sure you're well aware, the big companies, you know those companies, they keep track of your every online movement. They, they know what your eyes seek. It used to be that you had to click to find out what's behind, oh, what's at this link? It's very interesting. But now what do they do? You don't even have to click. They just serve it up to you on your feed. Autoplay. Or just, just all you have to do is scroll, and what you want is next. All right, just keep your eyes glued here, and you find out, wow, two hours has passed. Now, what's so wrong with appreciating beauty and spectacle? What's so wrong about that? The problem is not beauty in and of itself. The problem with the desires of the eyes is that it's, a fa it's fascination with the outward show of things without a corresponding concern for the inward reality. It's... It's looking at the outside without asking, what does God think of this? It's the love of beauty without the love of goodness. It's the love of flash at the expense of substance. That's what's wrong with the desires of the eyes. And finally, the third category that John provides uh, to help us understand what the world is or what, what are the things in the world, pride of life. The pride of life. These are the, all the things that the world boasts about. What does the world pound its chest about and say, look at me? Life considered apart from God is all about what? It's all about the pursuit of wealth, of security, of self-sufficiency, of comfort. You, you can go on and on. Pride, considered apart from God, is the pursuit of prestige, of titles, of honor, of popularity, of comparing yourself to others and saying, ah, I made it, not you. Again, it's so easy to pick on social media because, because it concentrates the world into one little package for us to scroll down, right? But what is social media so often about? Not all of it, but a lot of the social media is about the pride of life. Exactly this, the shameless display of, of your, of, you know, preening and, and, and showing yourself off. All these, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, John says, they are not from the Father, but they are from the world. Right? And that's why they are mutually exclusive from God. Now, there's a third thing to know about the world. Verse 17, and the world is passing away along with its desires. The pleasures and pursuits and glories of the world, the so-called glories of the world, in fact, they're so fleeting. John says they are fading away. Even now, they're fading away. They're like sandcastles at the shore, right? Sand, if you've ever seen sandcastles, like really well-made ones, right? They're nice to look at. They look awesome. But you know their fate. When the tide comes in, or when, even when the wind blows, inevitably, these structures will be gone. And likewise with the world, likewise with the desires of the world. And it seems to me that the world subconsciously knows that. That's why the world is always trying to sell the newest and the greatest thing. Because even after you get the newest and greatest thing, 
I don't have my phone on me. It's, it's not the newest and greatest, but let's say it was. That high you feel, that good feeling you have, how often, how long does it last? Not very long. Ah, but one month later, there's a new, newest and greatest thing, right? The world is so obsessed with that. Or the world is obsessed with what's trending now. What's everyone talking about? Not yesterday's news, what's today's news? You talk about, and you try to get into the conversation, ah, too late, the world has already moved on from that. COVID, that's not a thing. Nothing lasts. Everything crumbles and disintegrates. This is a feature of the world. The world allures us with its desires and its lusts, but it cannot fulfill its promises because it has no solid future. It is a sandcastle waiting for its fate. It's all passing away. And when Jesus' Jesus's kingdom comes, of course, it will fully pass away. To summarize, the world represents the buffet, the smorgasbord of idols all around us. You ever been to a buffet? Maybe not recently. Bad idea. But if, if you remember in your distant past going to a buffet, all these choices. Well, before you, you had any food yet, it looks really appetizing, right? All these choices, that's what the world is. All these choices of idols and false gods. They beckon us to worship them, to serve them. But the reality is they cannot fulfill their promises. They end up enslaving you. If you give in to them, you may, like Demas, fall away. Their end is that they will be swept away by the judgment of God. The title of today's sermon is Know Your Enemy, but of course it, that's not enough to simply know to simply have knowledge about our enemy? How are you to relate to the world? That is the critical question. So again, to return to verse 15, we are, this is how we're to, to relate to the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Notice that John does not say, shun the world. Completely remo remove yourself from the world. Come out of the world. Uh, don't have anything to do with the world. There are certain communities who take that approach, by the way, of completely trying to wall themselves off from the world. But that's not what John says. He doesn't say, you know, completely remove, remove yourself from the world. We are to remain in the world, but we are not to be of the world. And how, so how is that possible, that we are in the world but not of it? We are not to love the world. That means don't treasure the world. Don't cherish it. If I can put my own spin on what John is saying here, don't buy what the world is selling. The world is selling all these neat little trinkets. Don't buy it. It'll disintegrate in your hands. Now, how, how can we begin to do what John is saying? The first step, excuse, ooh, first step is to identify those areas in your life where you do, in fact, love the world. The reality is, why, why does John need to say, do not love the world? He needs to say it because, in many ways, we do exactly that. We love the world. In many ways, we give ourselves to false gods and to idols. Many, in many cases, we do it unknowingly, unwittingly. And so what we need to do is to identify in what ways we actually do love the world. Ask yourself, what things in the world pull at your heart? What things in the world do you give your heart to? What things in the world command your attention and your devotion? Now here's a series of diagnostic questions. It's actually a whole lot after I wrote them all out. 
There's a, I have a whole lot of diagnostic questions um, that are meant for you to ask yourself to help you identify in what ways do I love the world. If we're going to not love the world, first we've got to know where those areas that we actually do so that we can turn away from it. All right, ready? For, first is, what things do you impulsively check on your phone? Any of you have a, you, any, do any of you have this habit of impulsively checking something? Is there something important that you need to see there? I'm asking myself that. Do any of you impulsively check your social media feed every few minutes? Every free minute you have, you gotta check. Ask yourself, what desires motivate you to do that? Or, or perhaps others of you, do any of you impulsively check on things like the stock market? You need to know where the stock market is so that you can, you can understand where your investments are. You want, to know, you want to know within the hour where your accounts are. Or like me, do you impulsively check on your team? Uh, scores, stats? And you, when I say it out loud, it sounds ridiculous. Uh, knowing my own tendencies in this area, I am thankful when my teams are doing terribly. I'm thankful for those seasons because that's when I stop caring about them. That's when I stop checking the scores and the stats. It's, it's when my teams are winning, as, as the Sixers are doing, that I'm often carried away, not simply from following my team and appreciating them, but to this sort of obsessive fandom, this sort of preoccupation with them, overinvestment with what grown men are doing with a ball. Again, when you say it out loud, when you say these things out loud, uh, you can maybe a, a flash of light sh shines through. Do you, like me, love the world? Whatever we're captured by on our phones, especially with the phones, they seem to be what one author calls gentle-faced idols. Idols with gentle faces. In other words, they don't seem particularly harmful. We can say to ourselves, oh, these are just diversions, something, something I do when, when I have a little downtime. But the thing about even gentle-faced idols is that they tune our hearts to look to them for blessing. They change us to look to them. And so, when I do that, when I look to these gentle-faced idols for blessing, that's loving the world. And when I do that, the love of the Father is not in me. I wonder how many of us need to take the plunge and go old school. And by that I mean, get rid of your smartphone and get a dumb phone. You know what a dumb phone is? It does what phones do, which is call people. And that's it. Right? Or at the very least, if you can't go that far, delete certain apps. How many of us, by casting off this thing that weighs us down so much, will grow in leaps and bounds in our love and devotion for the Father, if we were to do so? I wonder. A second area, do you love the world when it comes to games and entertainment? And I, I might also add, uh, just consumption of mass media. Do you turn to these things, games, entertainment, media, in order to numb yourself from your life, your responsibilities, the daily realities that you deal with? Do you look to games and entertainment and media and similar things to give you rest for your soul? The rest that Actually, Jesus promises to those who come to him. Are you turning to the wrong thing? Another uh, question that's related to that, are your entertainment choices driven simply by what everyone else is watching? What's trending? What's everyone else talking about? Well, I want to watch too. 
But when you do that, you're not being careful to choose what will either hinder you or help you in your devotion to the Father. You're simply following the course of this world. Thirdly, do you love the world when it comes to food and drink? Are you ruled by your master, which is your stomach, or by your taste buds on whether or not it tastes exactly right? Do you turn to food and drink as a source of comfort or consolation when you have a bad day? Speaking of bodily appetites, do you turn to sex for comfort and consolation? Do you search out pornography or titillating images which promise liberation but instead enslave? Fourth, do you buy into the values of the world? What are the values of the world? What does the world define as success? If you searched hashtag blessed on social media, what would you see? Right? What does the world call the good life? What does the world say, this is what, it, this is what success is, this is a life worth living? I think, I think it's uh, in our circles, that is in, in, in CGC, very often, what the world teaches us, as in, you know, in our social, uh, socioeconomic circles, let's say, is it not academic and professional achievement? to get a stable and well-paying job. Are these not the things that we are taught is success? And the question is, do you uncritically receive the values of the world? So, yeah, that's, that's what it means to live a good life. Related to this, do you aspire to greatness compared to other people? Do you live for the approval and adulation and respect of others? Do you care more about what others think than, whether, than what God thinks? How often is your behavior driven by other, what others might think of you, on the one hand, versus how often do you do things in order to please your Father? How, see, you see, do you, sometimes we consciously think, what will other people think of me? How many times are you consciously thinking, what would please my father? I hope, there's, there's many more diagnostic questions that I can ask, but I hope that, that these questions can prime the pump and get us to think about our own selves, that none of us are immune from worldliness. It's, again, it's atmospheric. It's unconscious, it's invisible, it's all around us, we're breathing it in, and very often we might actually be loving the world. If you are able to identify certain areas in which this is true, what's next? Repentance. If you can see how the world has sucked you into its orbit, how do you get out? You get out by repenting. Turn from your sin. Repentance is turning from your sin. See the reality, the truth, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. So ask yourself, do you love God? Because if, if you love God, then you must hate your sin. If you love God, then you must do battle against your sin. Yes, it still pulls at your heart. Yes, it still tempts you. Which is why repentance is not only saying no to the world, repentance is also saying yes to a greater love. It is saying yes to God. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So to put it another way, if you love the Father, then you won't love the world. If you have the love of the Father in you, then that will drive out the love of the world. So church, we must grow in our love for the Father. 
How do we do that? How, we, how do we grow in our love for the Father? We must behold his glory in the face of his son, Jesus Christ. When you look at Jesus and you see his glory, then you will love him. So don't just say no to the world. Say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus because he is a merciful and faithful high priest who meets you exactly where you need his help. Say yes to Jesus because unlike false gods and idols and what the world promises, Jesus is faithful. He will keep his promises. Say yes to Jesus because he's able to keep his promises. He is strong and mighty. Say yes to Jesus because he is the Savior. He loves to rescue sinners who turn to him. Say yes to Jesus because he's the one who can truly satisfy your soul, because he is truly beautiful, and he is worth your obedience and worship, for he is the living God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we confess our sins, Lord, that in many ways we are captured by the world, that its tentacles are, have, have wrapped itself around so many parts of our lives. But Lord, we thank you that you have provided the means for us to say no to sin and to the world and to say yes to you. Empower us through your spirit that we might do that. Help us, Lord, to love, love the Father. And, and, and so by doing, we shall no longer love the world. In Jesus' name, amen.